All right, so Patrick Thibodeau, you are up. Okay, can you hear me this morning? Yes. Okay, great. So my name is Patrick Thibodeau. I'm a faculty at the University of Pittsburgh in the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics. And my talk may be a little bit of a um, departure from what you've heard um, in terms of uh, animal models and patient tissues and, and therapeutics that we are, my lab sort of works at the interface between physics and biology. And we're interested in understanding how proteins as machines work and how those get broken when you have variations in genes and really thinking about how we might fix them. So I thought I'd just give, because it's so different, I thought I might give a, just a quick slide on sort of what we do and how we do it. And so in the lab, we start by uh, growing cells uh, often in uh, bacteria, but sometimes in yeast and in mammalian cells. And we grow leaders of these cells uh, making uh, the protein of interest. So in this case, it's the ABCC6 gene and the protein. And then we go through a process where um, we can harvest those cells, for, uh, harvest the proteins from uh, cells that are grown like shown in this flask. We can purify the protein and then we can do a whole series of analyses, biochemical analyses on the protein to sort of understand what happens when we get uh, gene variants or mutations in the protein. And of course, we select those mutations to study based on um, the patient population and what's reported in the PXE database and elsewhere. And really one of the principal things that we like to do or we try to do is to understand the structure of the protein at the atom by atom level. And this involves taking these proteins, um, out, the purified proteins out of the cells and actually crystallizing them. And so I'm just showing you a, a series of protein crystals. These are um, uh, about half a millimeter across in most cases. So they're, they're quite small. And it's a lot like growing a sugar or salt crystal like you might have done uh, years ago as an elementary school uh, science project um, that these things form. And then once we have those, we can do our analyses. And we take these crystals and we typically take them to the synchrotron, which is a big particle accelerator. And there are half a dozen or so of them in the United States here. Um, and we bombard the crystals with x-rays. And when the x-rays go through the crystals, they make all these little spots on a detector over here. And then through some very complex math um, that um, we certainly don't wanna spend any time going through today, uh, we can actually calculate where all the electrons and all the atoms in the, in the crystal are. And so shown at the bottom is sort of a representation of what this might look like. And from there, we can actually draw the protein or put the physical basis of the protein, the machine into this map and get a feel for what it looks like. And this is sort of terribly boring looking at it. So I always have to sort of zap this up a little bit to get graduate students and, and patient groups involved. So I always say it's sort of like shooting them with the death ray uh, in Star Wars and uh, to get this information out of them. And because everybody else has animal models, here's my animal model. And I say, wow, that's really exciting if you're a biophysicist. So, um, you know, what do we get out of these? Well, one of the big things is to actually understand how the proteins work. And these are ABC transporters. So this is not ABCC6, not what gives rise to PXE, but a related ABC transporter uh, that, that's in the same family. It looks very, very similar and probably ABCC6 will look uh, very similar to this. And if you think about trying to troubleshoot a physical problem uh, with a machine, it's very helpful to be able to see it, to have a model of it so that you understand how it works. I mean, the, the analogy is sort of the, the blind man putting the hand on the elephant. Um, if you measure things indirectly, you get a feel for what it might be like, but uh, actually being able to see things works helps. So the model that we have here, these are two different views. They're little movies and I'll show you how we think these things work. Uh, and, and these are the proteins in the cell surface. So the, the, the membrane of the cell or the, the barrier of the cell uh, is this gray box or lines that runs across the slide. The inside of the cell is at the bottom and the outside of the cell is at the top. And putatively, ABCC6 is transporting something. It's moving a molecule out of the cell and the liver and the kidney and into the bloodstream where then uh, it has an effect on the serum and, and the uh, calcium and magnesium um, deposition that you've heard about before. Uh, 
And what happens, what we think happens is a molecule called ATP, which is an energy source for the cell, binds in this lower region of the protein. And when that happens, these two pieces come together. So this is just a movie that shows you how we think this actually happens, where we start in the absence of the molecule, and then when it binds, it causes these two halves of the protein to come together. And it doesn't look like much happens here in the membrane, but if we rotate the molecule 90 degrees, so we start in the absence of ATP in the same, just a different view on the, uh, on the right here, and you'll see that uh, there's an opening that comes at the outside of the cell. So we start with this opening on the inside of the cell, and basically as the protein then moves, we can move something across the cell membrane and out of the cell through this hole or through this channel that gets formed. And we know that's the basis of a lot of diseases associated with uh, ABC transporters, that it's either a defect in making the protein and getting it into the cell or a defect in the ability of getting uh, this molecule across the membrane. So actually the functioning of the machine is broken. So the question really then for us becomes, now that we have images of this, what can we do with these and, and how we move forward? So the first thing that we wanted to do was to really understand in better detail ABCC6. And as I said, this is a related protein, but not ABCC6. And for a variety of technical reasons, it's very difficult to work with proteins that are actually in the membrane. But there's some tricks we do to basically uh, pull out pieces of the protein and work with individual uh, parts of the protein one at a time. So that's where we have started and spent a fair amount of our time over the last uh, eight or 10 years trying to understand what happens uh, when we introduce PXE associated uh, gene variations to this. So I'll just show you, uh, we have uh, solved the uh, structures of the individual domains of ABCC6. And um, we have grown these, so we've purified the protein, we grow these crystals. So shown uh, in these images are a series of crystals and they're easier to see in the, in the bottom uh, view here where these little white areas where they're uh, in the shadowed pool, those are actually the crystals. We pull those out of this uh, drop and we do the X-ray uh, diffraction with them and then we can calculate what the protein actually looks like. And so this is uh, one piece of the protein in, in just two different views. And we actually have the nucleotide or in this case it's ADP, not ATP, that's bound uh, to this region of the protein. And we've done that for, for both of the pieces on the inside of the cell. So these are the motors of the protein that actually provide the energy It's the uh, to, to facilitate transport. And so we know these two things associate. We've, we've done a lot of modeling to understand this. And without getting into a lot of sort of really nerdy protein details, looking at these images is not terribly useful. But I'll tell you, for researchers being able to visualize these and understand where sequence variants fall, whether they're on one side of the protein or the other, whether they're on the top or the bottom, inside or out, is tremendously useful for us to understand how they might be acting to disrupt the function of these machines. So uh, we've also spent uh, quite a bit of time profiling uh, disease-associated or PXE-associated uh, uh, gene variants uh, in these and trying to understand how they affect both the structure of these domains and the uh, energetics, the, the stability of these domains. And so just shown here is a, a representative slide where we've basically looked at a whole series of uh, PXE associated uh, gene or sequence variations. We've introduced these into a number of biochemical experiments where we can measure the production of the protein, the stability of the protein and the function of the protein. And we're now with these structures able to map these into these domains to actually see physically where they are and provide a physical basis for what we see biochemically, which I said is, is quite important. We can do this in the context of the entire protein. So this is just one piece of the protein. We do the same thing in the context of the entire protein. And shown at the top is what we call a Western blot. This is just our uh, ability to detect ABCC6 in a cell. And where we have a, a dark spot here means we're making we're making an ABCC6 molecule. And where that's missing or where the uh, spot is uh, greatly diminished, as we see, here, we basically know that the cell is unable to make 
uh, this protein at high levels. So we can take these pieces of information and we can start to understand uh, what mutations do. And I'm, I'm not really gonna uh, worry about telling you the details about all of this, but the bottom line is that we're now able to sort of classify uh, sequence variations uh, depending not only on the, the phenotype in the patient, meaning the presentation in the patient population, but where we find it structurally in the protein and what it might be doing to the protein. And this is very important for us as, as biophysicists and, bio, and me as a biochemist to think not only about what is it doing to the protein, but to start to think about how we might correct that as a defect. And as Sharon uh, mentioned a, a little while ago in, in cystic fibrosis, there are a variety of uh, drugs that have come available that basically fix these problems in CF. And so this is a parallel approach to thinking about um, uh, pyrophosphate treatment or some sort of dietary supplementation with PXE, where we could think about uh, a chemical, what we call a chemical chaperone or a drug that solves this problem, that fixes the problem in our molecular machine. And by being able to show or identify these different classes of sequence variations and their effect on the protein, it allows us to think about how many different steps or, or, or defects we might have in actually building this machine or how the machine might function. And it, it also allows us to think about if we had a a drug that affected one class of mutations, it gives us a sense of how many different sequence variations might respond positively uh, to, that, uh, to that small molecule or that drug. We don't wanna have to identify a new drug for every single uh, sequence variant that we find in ABCC6 or in, or in any disease. We, we would like to find drugs that basically work on uh, on all the uh, sequence variants that we might have. And by doing this, we can start to classify these and think about how we might target um, small molecules uh, to that end. And so the final thing to say is by, by doing this, and we are not in the process of looking for small molecules at this point, but we can take this information and we can begin to look for mechanisms to think about designing the experiment that we could go uh, identify a drug with. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to do that. And at the bottom, I'll just show you that we, we again, we have Western blots. And in this case, what we've done is we've taken a, uh, a disease associated uh, sequence variant. Uh, so these are all of these indications at the top are different variants that are found in the PXE uh, uh, database. And when we express those alone, you can see in these panels that they either don't make protein or they only make a small amount of protein. By introducing a second mutation, and these are mutations that we know precisely what they do to the protein, so we have a mechanism, we can actually restore the production of these proteins in the cell. So if you were in, uh, if you, for example, had this R1314Q uh, sequence variant, we would expect that you would make a very small or, uh, whoops, my apologies, a very small amount of protein or no uh, protein in the cell. And by specifically modifying the protein and doing something that we understand quite well about um, the structural alterations, we can restore uh, this protein to very high expression levels. And so this would be the goal for a small molecule uh, therapeutic if we wanted to develop a drug to do the same thing. And again, because we understand exactly what we're doing to the protein at this point, it makes it much easier for us to think about designing an assay or an experiment to go look for a, a small molecule or drug that might have this effect. So just in summary, uh, my lab has spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to determine the structures of both uh, of, uh, of ABCC6 as well as other ABC transporters. We've got a variety of these structures that have been solved. If people have any interest in seeing them, I'm, help, I'm happy to facilitate that. I, I realize it's sort of looking at curly cues and arrows on the screen. Um, and that is that is a challenge even for other scientists sometimes. We've got a very extensive biochemical and cell biological analysis of about 150 PXE associated sequence variants at this point. We understand how these cluster together. We, we have mechanisms uh, by which we can uh, fix each of these things as well. And again, the goal of all of this is to basically understand what's going wrong when we get variations in ABCC6 and then how we might fix those if we're thinking about a therapeutic. And then finally, just to say, we continue to work on the idea 
that we want the structure of the full length protein so we can understand what it's actually transporting, how it's transporting that, what that actually looks like for us. And that gets us a lot closer to understanding uh, what's going wrong in the disease. And we're pivoting to, to basically look at a whole new class of mutations, which are the nonsense mutations. And uh, these mutations are fundamentally different from the mutations we've looked at uh, thus far, but of course, uh, uh, include some of the, the most common mutations, including things like the 1141X uh, allele. And I'll stop there. I, I just want to thank um, two people who've done a tremendous amount of this work uh, in my lab, and that is, whoops, uh, Yan Chao Ran, who's a postdoc, and Ai Ping Zing, uh, and they've, they've uh, performed the bulk of the experiments that I told you today. And thank you for your time. Great. Thanks so much, Patrick, for joining us on <clears throat> Saturday, uh, Sunday morning. What day is uh, <laughs> uh, questions. As you were speaking, so, one of the things I was thinking about is that I think um, we all don't understand a lot of times how much work it goes, goes into describing every single piece of this along the way, whether it's the physics or the chemistry or the biology. And it's really great to, to see that here. Yeah, and I, I did get a question via chat. It looks like it was directly to me that was, would a drug that can cause this molecular change repair, reverse damage, or only prevent further disease progression? And I, I think I don't really have a good answer to that question, uh, unfortunately. I think that's, that's yet to be seen how much uh, disease progression reversal we'll see in the animal models and the patient population as we develop these therapeutics. I, I will say that in cystic fibrosis and a number of other diseases where we've developed drugs that do this, uh, the pathology of the disease is such that it will uh, at least partially revert um, uh, the disease. So it's not only just a, an arrest, but you do get sort of a reversion to a more normal phenotype. But I think that's very, very disease specific. So I hate to say that that would happen here in, in PXE. Um, I would be hopeful that it would, that the body would, as we resolve the calcium uh, deposits, that some of that damage might be uh, reversed. Uh, but I think uh, that's, uh, that's yet to be determined at this point. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank well, you. Thank you. All right.